you there. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio show and podcast featuring your physician host, Dr. Tom McGovern. And Dr. Chris Stroud. And this is the show where we discuss relevant health-related topics and always from an authentically Catholic perspective. Now, Dr. Doctor is brought to you in part by the generous underwriting of our friends at CMF Curo. You can learn more at mycatholichealthcare.com. Dot org. You can live your Catholic faith with your health care with CMF Curo. Today, our guest will be heard across the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Joining us today will be Dr. Liz Heine. She has a doctorate in psychology. She's also a certified physician assistant. She has been working in the area of infant mental health for over 45 years. That's a whole lot of experience. So we're going to talk about what are some of the risks to infants. I didn't even know infant mental health was a thing until within the last couple of years. And I guess it's a really big thing. So she is going to share a lot of that with you, hopefully with a little nudging from Chris and me. Now, Chris, you take care of moms before birth and a little bit after birth. And you see moms and their babies. Uh, Do you ever identify or notice where there seems to be a challenge between moms and their babies connecting? Yes. I mean, and I think maybe even before we get to that, we should say, listeners, don't don't touch that dial. You know, you might (laughs) think, oh, this is going to be someone invented another way for parents to be bad parents. You didn't do a good job, so your baby has a mental health problem. Um, No, that's not what we mean. (laughs) Whether you let your baby cry it out to sleep or not cry it out to sleep or (laughs) breastfeed or bottle feed or spank or don't spank. This isn't that episode. (laughs) (laughs) This is not that. Yeah, that's right. Plenty of time for that, and this isn't it. Um, But this idea really may be the topic instead of being infant mental health, maybe it should be sort of couplet mental health or even family mental health. Um, But yes, you know, I've seen countless examples through the years where even pre-birth during the pregnancy, you think, wow, I can't put my finger on it, but I think there's something amiss here. Maybe there is a relationship dynamic between husband and wife. Maybe the parents are not married and there's a story there. Maybe there's a story with their families because they're not married. Maybe there's infidelity. Maybe there's a history of of marital or relationship problems. And you can just tell uh, when you're talking that what's going to happen to this already broken, fragile relationship when we plop a baby in the middle of it? Because anybody who has a child knows it's a big deal when you put a baby in the middle of a relationship. Um, and so so stay tuned, listeners. I, I know that you're going to find this an interesting and important topic. But the idea that mother and baby attaching could somehow go wrong, on the one hand, seems impossible, but it's not. It's very possible. And it happens all the time. Let's face it. We live in a broken world, don't we? And maybe if we could intervene early on and stop some of that brokenness between mother and baby and father and baby and family and baby and mother and father, maybe we could really go a step towards stopping and repairing some of the brokenness in the world. Yes. You know, I had a a conversation with Liz, you know, in prepping for the episode And uh, I think what Chris said is absolutely true. I always thought it was just looking at the baby in isolation. Uh, It's far from that. And, you know, Liz is going to talk about what are some signs that baby is having some mental health problems. They they can actually figure that out, which to me uh, is amazing. Uh, But it is uh, true that how parents react around the baby affects the baby. It affected all of us Mm -hmm. growing up for better or for worse. And we're... Mm -hmm going to try to learn how do we get over to the better side of the ledger. And I, I think she'll probably talk about it, but uh, you know, and some of our listeners know that my wife and I are, are adoptive parents um, yes. and our adopted oh, children spent, spent their first few years um, in, in an orphanage in Africa that let's just say wasn't wonderful. Um, adopted children, especially when they've been orphaned as infants, often have attachment problems. There's even a condition called radical attachment disorder where they just don't make attachments to their caregivers uh, as adults. And so um, it's a real problem that affects real people. I think we're going to learn some interesting stuff that maybe we could make that better. Yeah, Liz is going to talk about orphanages and how that uh, led to this field when people didn't believe that orphanages were really having uh, 
an, an impact, you know, getting your, your three squares, you know, a cot and three hots a day wasn't enough for <laughs> newborn babies. Uh, so that is important. It, uh, she's also going to be talking about, uh, well, I don't know if she's going to be talking about adoption, but that's an interesting point to bring up because that would be different. You don't have the, you know, the, the mothering hormone going around there, that uh, prolactin. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting. We're recording this immediately after recording the postpartum mood disorders. And now right. we've got another postpartum thing, and that is raising this little baby. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's funny. I mean, one of my favorite examples of attachment between mother and baby, um, it's, it's almost artful. Uh, watch uh, in the mall or in a restaurant, uh, a mother and an infant. They spend most of their time just staring at each other. Yes, yes. Um, but it turns out, and I think our guest may may reference that, that actually does something to the baby's brain. It, yes. it actually forms things inside their brain. And that means the absence of that eye-to-eye -eye contact with their mother, with their fathers, like you and I to a degree. But let's face it, we're just not as important as the mothers, at least not at this particular moment uh, in the right. development of the child. That actually does something in their brain, and the absence of it doesn't do what it's supposed to, uh, just proving, if you will, um, that there has to be this attachment. And if that attachment doesn't go well, there could be downstream, as we say, implications. But there's also good things that can be done, even if it didn't go initially well. And Liz is going to talk about that. Absolutely. So before we get to our guest tonight, we've got a medical trivia question. It might just have something to do with our topic. Let me see here. The question deals with, yeah, baby brains. That's the yeah, category. That, you, you don't mean very small brains by that. You meant the brains of infants. Uh, which are relatively small compared to adult <laughs> brains. Now, fascinating. They have about the same number of nerve cells or neurons as an adult brain, between 85 and 100 billion. But their size is not the same. So what percent of an adult brain size is a newborn's baby's brain? Mm. Okay, somewhere between you know one and a hundred. Okay, I'm not giving anything away with that. So to get the answer, you'll have to listen through to the end of the show. But we'll be right back with Liz Hine and infant mental health here on Doctor Doctor right after the break. Welcome back to Doctor Doctor, and we have today's special guest with us, Doctor Liz Hine, who's also a physician assistant. The topic: infant mental health. Liz graduated with a master's degree in pediatrics and a physician assistant degree from the University of Colorado, and then got a doctor in psychology from Argosy University in Dallas. She currently works in the pediatric outpatient setting at hospital or hospitals in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex area. She's received some big commendations in 1992 from President George Book Bush, recognizing her service to high-risk infants and family. And in 2002, 20 years ago, she got the T. Barry Brazelton Infant Mental Health Award. She's been a member of the Catholic Medical Association for the last eight years. She's married to the Dallas Guild president, Dr. Roy Hine, a pediatrician, has eight children and currently 24 grandchildren. Liz, welcome <laughs> to Dr. Doctor. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be on this program. I love your program. So, longtime listener, first time guest, right? So yeah, tell right. us a story that illustrates what infant mental health is to make this real to listeners. Because when I first heard the, the, that it was a thing, I didn't even know what it meant. Right. Most people think it's like a baby on the couch, like you're trying to analyze the baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, what, that's what Tom and I said when we in our intro. We said, you know, this is not another field of study that is finding a way to blame parents for being bad parents. <laughs> no, um, that's, that's not what we're talking about. So let that's me give what, you, I think, an extraordinary example of, first of all, what this entails and also how hmm. important it is. So I do um, well baby care as well as um, sick baby care. And I had a mother bringing her twins at eight months of age and they were had reactive airway disease they were premature and so um sick running fevers and everything so i attended to starting to give them their aerosols and she said oh by the way liz can i have that blue and white form that you um give out i said oh you mean the depression inventory she goes yes I said sure <laughs> so while i'm attending to the kids she's filling out the form and she gives it to me and she scores extremely high she wasn't suicidal but it was so high that i said okay we have to attend to this besides attending to your babies can you tell me a little bit more about this and so oh, i have to say that most of my work is in spanish so this was a hispanic 
so I was doing this in Spanish and yeah. it's really extraordinary because a lot of times um, they don't like to talk about this. And so when she said, can you do this? I was like, sure. Well, in asking some questions, she was saying that she was locking herself in the bathroom and she was afraid to go out. And I said, what do you mean? Well, she said, well, she was hearing voices oh. and she said the voices were telling her to take the knife out of the kitchen and to slit her four children's throats. Oh my gosh. So she was trying to protect her children and protect herself by locking herself in the bathroom. But when yeah. I heard so that- let me, let me interject. In the show we just did and probably will have aired last week for yes. listeners on the radio, we talked about postpartum psychosis. Yes, this, this is what And, and, and is Francie it. said that with postpartum psychosis, and, and you're illustrating it, the, the victim, the patient can actually identify they're having these uh, weird thoughts that don't belong and yet- do something to protect the baby. It's fascinating that those two things can be going on at the same time. And she knew at least to lock herself up because yeah. it was telling to do otherwise. So what I did is I proceeded then to um, call her husband and then to make arrangements. I took her over to the psychiatric emergency room where she was actually admitted. She was in for about a week. She got on her antipsychotics yeah. because of the, the fear of having her alone with the children while dad was at work. She was, um, had to be with somebody for about a year, but honestly, she did so well. And I followed this children for about four years, completely fine. Mm -hmm. But I really did feel she resist is, going to the hospital to the emergency no, room. Not at was all. she happy? She was. She was fearful. She was very fearful. And I, I sat, I sat with her, walked with her, and I remember it was so. Um, she was so traumatized just the fact of having to go into an emergency room and on all this. But mm -hmm. uh, I, the fact that I really like it is she just felt comfortable enough to say. Hey Liz, can I have that blue and white form? I mean, I don't know what would have happened had she not gotten the help. Wow! So that's, yeah. I guess, a really extraordinary example. But I have others too. So, well, you know, uh, we love definitions in medicine, and we love terms and terminology, don't we? But you yes. know, not that we're playing off the "what is a woman" craze, but um, <laughs> because because the three of us know, I'm thinking. Um, but how about how about if we say, "What is an infant?" All righty. So if it is a person who doesn't speak, doesn't have language, okay, if you want to be really technical about it. Yeah, but in no. this situation, we're going to talk about the infant being actually the child in the womb, and also as a person who actually doesn't speak or doesn't have language yet. But in our definition of the infant, we're going to go actually the fetus in utero and all the way up to actually 60 months of age or five years of age is what we're going to call infant when we're identifying infant mental health. So it's wow. all the way from the fetus all the way up to 60 months of age. And that is because uh -huh. some of the therapies we have actually work up to age 60 months of age. So what is infant mental health? Because okay. like you said, we, we picture the little baby on the couch, but it's not that. Not quite. It's, it's the, um, the social and emotional well-being of the very young child well, like I said, like up to age five years of age, in the context, and this is where it's so important, it's the relationship between the caregiver, the mother or the father, or whoever that caregiver might be, and it's the family relationships. It begins, like I said, in utero and extends all the way up to age 60 months. And so what's important is you have actually three patients, the caregiver, <laughs> mother, father, the child, and then the dyad, the, the relationship between the two that you've got to look at. That, that so really you include speaks, the mother and um, the father. That's good. Correct. <laughs> yeah, it speaks to Tom and I's, you know, sort of discussion back and forth in the intro session that it, the, the title is a little a little misgiving, isn't it? Because correct. it's more than just the infant. Correct. Because I'm sure listeners are thinking, you know, a two-week-old infant, how do they have mental health? They eat, they sleep, they pee, they poop. Uh, but it's really this entity that involves multiple people, isn't it? Yes, but little babies, even two months of age, can be depressed. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about infants, babies with mental health so, issues. So what does a depressed two-week-old look like? So usually in a depressed baby, they're not going to be feeding. They kind of shut down and they don't respond. So mm -hmm. that would be one uh, reason that we would want to really work hard with this mother well and and I think you can really uh, lay into this idea because of how this developed, you know, over the last 50 years. You were telling me, you know, beforehand something about studies in unhappy places called orphanages. Correct. Right. So, first of all, it used to be that children should be seen and not heard hmm. and that infants just poop pee and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. And that the, um, the whole idea that an infant is much more than what we 
think or attribute an infant to actually goes back to the time when there were children, lots of children in orphanages, and there would be such a thing as institutionalism where the children would die. Hmm. And this is, we're talking about, you know, 1800s or so, and these children in orphanages would die, and they really couldn't figure out what was going on. And then we had people like Dr. Robinson and Dr. Wolby in England who started looking at what happens to kiddos in hospitals. Because remember, we didn't have hospital visitation for parents until maybe not, well, it didn't start really until Dr. Robinson did his videotape where he looked at a two-year-old, what happens in the hospital? Because before that, parents were off limits because they could bring in germs. What decade would this have been? Yeah. Um, so it was 1953 when Dr. Robinson okay. did his very famous, and you can see it on YouTube, a two-year-old goes to the hospital. Mm. And it shocked people like, oh, he made it up. Oh, this really didn't happen. <laughs> actually, it really did. So he actually was the one who changed the whole visitation. Because before that, can you imagine, you have your child in the hospital, you can only visit like one hour a week. Oh my! What happens is, uh, and what, what happened in the orphanages is, is, okay, first of all, the child cries because they miss their parent, but then there's no response. The parent, the parent's not there. And so the child kind of gives up and then mm. shuts down, stops eating. And this was what was happening. Um, I think in some of the institutions. Now you mentioned another orphanage, what happened in Romania and they actually did a study um, this is not that long ago, where they looked at the PET scans of these little kiddos. Now, they were given shelter, they were given uh, uh, clothes, and they were fed, but they didn't have a primary caregiver that they could attach to, which is mm -hmm. so critical for the brain development. And so when they look at the PET scans between a child who has a normal caregiver versus those who don't, they actually showed areas of the brain that had atrophied, mm -hmm. and the areas particularly with empathy were just really, really decreased. And that's pretty outstanding because it's actually affecting the brain of these small children, which is, if you remember with organization of the brain, what happens with but, pruning. But can they get that empathy back afterwards? Okay. So when I work with mothers who have had an insecure attachment where they've had perhaps no empathy, if you remember the empathy is kind of that limit part of your brain. And if you don't have that natural empathy. If you can't read the cues of your other person, if I can't read what your emotions are, but what I can do as a infant mental health specialist is I can, for instance, videotape a particular situation. I had a mother who honestly had never had anyone to pick her up when she was crying or kiss her boo boo when she fell down. And so I'm videotaping her and this child fell down. She was really crying hard and I'm videotaping and, and mom kind of laughed and just kind of turned away. So after the videotape, I said, hey, what do you see? Oh, oh yeah, that happened to me all the time. Nobody ever picked me up. I said, okay, well, she's really hurting. So to answer your question, I'm gonna show the mother, this is a child who's hurting, read her cues. She needs you to pick her up. She needs to be cuddled. She needs to be, oh, I'm so, you know, like what we would normally do. But mm. what, in order to answer your question is you don't use your limbic part of your brain. You use a higher cognitive. Okay, maybe I don't feel it, but I know this is the right way to do it. So you can break mm. the cycle of generation upon a generation of no empathy. So you're going to use the ah, higher brain. The so, prefrontal cortex. Yeah, we've exactly, talked about it before on the show. Exactly. Yep. What's cortex. right behind the face palm area. Right. So if the mother knows, it, okay, I don't feel it, but I've been taught to see but it. I know it. Now I can do it. And it really worked beautifully for this mother. Well, that's kind of a good segue, I think, into this idea that something that happens in, in those early years of a child's life could have effects on them, you know, down, down the road. How do those early experiences in the early years affect the trajectory of, of a child's life? Well, I mentioned what could happen actually to the brain structure to those yes. parts of the brain with empathy that was shown very nicely in that study that you can see on the PET scans. But also if you want to talk about the ACE study, the adverse oh. childhood experiences, okay? That's something that can have huge implications later on as an adult. Mm -hmm. And if you remember what the ACEs are, there's three abuses, sexual and uh, emotional. And well, what physical. does ACE stand for? I'm sorry, adverse childhood experiences. And this is probably over 30 years now where the um, doctors, uh, Faletti and Dr. Uh, Enda from the CDC, were looking at uh, patients from the Kaiser Permanente. And there's a fascinating story how it all started, but 
um, to go on with it. <laughs> they came up with 10 very key, it was an incredible story how it started. By the time later, I'll explain. But they came up with 10 very important points that if this happens during your childhood, before the age of 18, it can have huge implications what happens to you later in life, including your health, what age you can die. Mm -hmm. um, so this is extremely important to understand um, what these adverse child experiences are. And if you want me to name them, I can. But Yeah, go ahead. What are some of the things on this yeah. list? I just, okay, I mentioned the three types of abuse. So physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. And then you have neglect, emotional neglect, okay? And also um, physical neglect where you're not cared for. If you have a mother or father with a history of mental illness, particularly maternal depression, if you have a history of losing a parent, either through divorce or perhaps death or abandonment, um, this would be a, a, another adverse child experience. If you've had a family history of one of your parents on drugs or mm -hmm. the history of domestic violence, um, these, all of these, even if it happens just one time, that's one point. So let's suppose you're physically abused 10 times, that still would just be one point. So you add up these 10 different scores and when they first did this among the Kaiser Permanente, they found a third, and this was middle class um, people that were taking this because they worked for Kaiser, so they had insurance. So about a third of the people had a pretty zero perfect childhood as far as their first child experiences. However, two thirds did not. And the highest were usually among women who had unfortunate the sexual assault. So this is extremely important to look at trauma, what's happened um, when working with the parent. So what women should be doing this ACE score, you know, when they're pregnant? I mean, do ob guys do this in their office, Chris? Have you heard of it? No, sadly, um, I, I, most of that doesn't happen. I mean, I guess, you know, in an in institution and in large systems, they will often have social workers and others that will sort of, you know, develop and implement programs like this. But I think day to day across the world, uh, it probably gets competed, out competed by other things, don't you think? Um, don't you think? I, it's pretty easy to ask for. I ask it pretty routinely. Mm. And I used to give an example. I used to be furious when I would go into examine a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. And it's just like, how could you do this to your child? <laughs> and then I asked the questions and I find out, well, actually, you know, as a young child, she witnessed her father being shot in the head. It can so, make perfect sense, right? When yeah. is, okay, um, my approach is a little bit different, okay? Or smoking, when I go in, i ugh, overwhelmed by the nicotine, you know, it's like <laughs> blown away. And I'm thinking, here they have a premature baby. And so instead of saying, oh, stop the smoking, I'll say, oh, I know you're trying to cut down. Tell me what you're doing. And then we try to find other coping mechanisms because mm -hmm. lots of tap happens with the high A scores is they have this trauma, which leads to poor interaction, poor healthy choices. Mm -hmm. And they get into all sorts of drugs or whatever it is to help cope, which leads to then early morbidity and then early mortality. So but Liz, early, are you I, able to give this to women who are pregnant or are you only yeah, seeing women after? Yes. So part of how my do you see is, them? Yeah. How do okay. you get to those patients? So um, in my work, I realized that we needed um, a home for our pregnant mother. So I, I helped with uh, Mother Teresa set up a home that we have for uh, pregnant mothers. So I'm there every, every week working with pregnant mothers. And I just routinely, very, very nonchalantly kind of go through, like, I don't say, were you sexually assaulted? Say, oh, just tell me what age were you sexually assaulted? <laughs> wow. Okay, so anybody with a score above five, you can expect a lots of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, my average score for all my mothers is seven with some perfect tens. And so you can expect smoking. You can expect even later on in life, they're gonna be on antidepressants. Even they've shown to be have hallucinations um, that affects their whole um, mental health. So um, when I see that, I know that, okay, this is, I have to have trauma focused and I have to be really patient. It's not quick, but it gives me a little bit more of a perspective of what, what I'm dealing with. Also, it gives me a huge appreciation of where I've come from and like, okay, I'm really going to try to bury the best I can to help this mother who. Maybe so so Liz, it. that's a good segue. You've been doing this over 45 years. What got you interested in this field? So my grandmother was a pediatrician. And she Your grandma? In, my grandma. Yeah, she, she was one of the first. Yeah. And she worked in Harlem. And um, then as wow. a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. And she learned Spanish too. So as a teenager, I would go around and make home visits with her. 
and I loved what she did. And she also told me all these stories about the infectious and how, uh, how important the immunizations were. So I use mm-hmm. that on my patients all the time. And so then my father was a psychiatrist. And so oh that's where I got both interests. Um, there you go. <laughs> and, I would, and, and in grade school, I would play Lucy and do the ink blots. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love um, it. It looked like this. Yeah, the, the psychiatrist yeah. is in. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's why I went and got my PsyDs because I love issues with mental health and mm-hmm. how to help these people. And of course, what my grandmother did. So that's why it was kind of a natural thing. And then because um, I was able to learn Spanish, I thought this is really important to be able to to reach this population in their own language. So but it sounds like, Liz, listening to you describe your work, you're, you're sort of the ultimate and root cause analysis. And you see a problem instead of just <laughs> looking at the problem, you start looking at things that happened maybe, maybe in the mother or the grandmother's lives, maybe generations ago. And um, I mean, that just makes so much sense listening to it. Um, but it is remarkable and scary to think about how childhood experiences could have such far-reaching implications. It's, but, but it is challenging, but also there's hope because mm. you have to start somewhere. They yeah. call it portals of entry. And it might be the mother coming in for a, a behavioral issue with her child. Or it might be this mother who came in because her kids were wheezing, you know, and she's, oh, by the way, I'm psychotic. Uh, but so you're going to look for ways of, of, of reaching them. And they may not come out and say, hey, I have an infant mental health program problem there'll be other issues that'll come up with the trauma and then once you get in it sometimes i say i've never told anybody about this before <laughs> we're the first person you know and then it's, it's a relationship very much a relationship based so liz like, um i'm sure that you're very unique but how unique are you and by that i mean how many professionals are there like you in the u.s that are spending their professional energy doing this kind of work there's lots of environmental health um uh, specialists, okay, and they might be in pediatrics. They could be psychiatry. They could be social work. They could be mm-hmm. occupational therapy. So when you say infant mental health, it's not one one specialty. Uh, it's someone who has taken this training in infant mental health, and there's four different levels of training that you get endorsed that the University of Michigan's put out. So it's it's actually um, it, it's out there, and it's come really explosive as far as the number of research papers that have been written. I just did a. Um, uh, a research on about 3,000 articles over the last, say, 30 years. Wow. Uh, as far as infant mental health and also get preterm babies and um, post traumatic stress. And I found starting way back in 80, there might be one or two research articles, including a psychiatrist who said in the NICU we need to have a psychiatrist. But anyway, there was. Well, Liz, I'm going to interrupt you because that seems like a perfect time to pause for our break and talk more about these findings when we get back. We'll be right back with our mental, infant mental health expert on <laughs> Dr. Doctor. Welcome back to Dr. Doctor with our doctor guest, uh, Liz Hine, talking about infant mental health. Liz, right before the break, you were talking about a really large study. Pick up uh, where we left off and continue sharing that with us. What I did was review of studies for the last 30 years. And what was remarkable in doing this was that in the 80s, 90s, even um, up into just the last few years, there were very, very few studies on infant mental health. And I was looking particularly in the NICU, neonatal intensive care unit. And then just recently, there's been an explosion of this. So that is now, uh, like I'm talking about 120 studies just this last year versus, you know, previously like one or two, to the point now that we are training neonatologists and other people in the intensive care unit to recognize infant mental health and even we're doing research. So, for instance, we're doing cognitive behavior therapy. So, and- Liz, what does that what does that what does that mean? It sounds like great news, I think, to listeners yeah. and to me and Tom. But what's that mean? Are we awakening to the importance uh, of this time, or what does that mean? I think it's not just about if, if the child's going to survive or you know what the what the latest antibiotic might be but we've got to look at the relationships and because we found in some studies hey by having a very um a very good intervention for instance looking at post traumatic stress in the intensive care unit or looking at depression among mothers if we're able to help these parents you can actually cut down on intensive care days mm. because and that's really important, cutting down on the number of days that a child until discharge, or we're looking at other ways of training people to recognize issues, to even bring it up with fathers, depressed fathers, or post-traumatic stress in fathers. And 
the, the importance of looking at this. So yes, it's now come to the for, uh, foresight of many people to the point where it's actually now going to be a standard of care, not mm-hmm. just the medical care, but to actually do have mental health specialists like in the NICU, as well as in pediatric practices to have mm-hmm. people that can think about this. Now, besides clinical practice, you also do research, and you recently did a study with teenage moms. Tell us about that. Well, it actually, it was quite a while back, and so I had um, I had a total of thirty mothers in my intervention and thirty in my control. So it was a randomized control trial, and I thought the white elephant in the exam room for me, just in doing my well baby care, you might say, was hmm. the depression. And so I thought, well, I'm going to do the study with a psychiatric social worker. And the um, so sure enough, we found in both groups, there was 30% at one month post delivery of postpartum depression. And so I tried to devise, okay, for the control group, we're just going to do our standard care, you know, well baby visits, sick visits, but we're going to try to do an intervention for those other um, mothers. And so what we did is we looked at a year later and sure enough, those mothers that are in control and their babies got the good care that we give, but we still had a third of the mothers still depressed. Whereas in our other group, it wasn't quite the p-value that was significant, but it was like 30% in the um, control group versus 18%. So it gone from 33% down to 18%, which again mm-hmm. is quite statistically significant, but we knew we were on the right track. But more mm-hmm. important for me, which is why I really thought I've got to go learn more, was when we looked at the depressed mothers, that I also looked at the history of sexual assault. And when I looked at those mothers, history of sexual assault. And then also I looked at, unfortunately, we have to make referrals to child protective services, specifically for neglect. They're not feeding their children, the children are failing to thrive. And when I looked at the number of referrals, who was referred? And then I looked at, those are the mothers who were depressed. Those are the mothers who had had a history of sexual assault. Now my study didn't address what came first, but I thought, oh my gosh, I'm identifying we have depression among our mothers. We have history of sexual assault. And we have babies that are being neglected. This is really important to know. And so that's why I thought this is uh, enough to go ahead and get more training so I could figure out what to do with this problem. So, well, Which is a great question. What You said there's, there's hope for these relationships. Well, so, very much so why don't you start going through some of the different things that can be done to bring a positive relationship out of a negative one? Sure. So you can start actually in pregnancy. Dr. Alicia Lieberman actually has a very specific therapy that you can start using right with pregnant mothers to see how the relationship is with their baby in utero and to work with those mothers. If they're telling you that they the baby is really going to be a burden or the baby is going to be whatever, meg- negative, you can work with those mothers. Mm-hmm. And so we have parent-child psychotherapy. We also have um, PCIT, which is parent-child interaction therapy that we can start at age two to up to uh, 60 or uh, five years of age. We also have cognitive behavior therapy. Like I said, we're doing in the NICU. We have um, circle of security, which is a, another type of, um, we can do this in groups where we're trying to help build attachment, secure attachment. Because remember, I said a lot of the parents I work with may have lots of issues with trauma and may not have empathy. So we can do we can do group um, psychoeducation, we call it. But there is evidence-based therapies that we can offer these mothers and So, so tell us, in, in, in pregnancy, what are some of the concrete things that you can do with a mom who has a, a negative view of this baby she's carrying? So usually in that case, she's got a negative view about herself. Mm-hmm. And what was called by Dr. Um, Selma Freiberg, the ghosts in the nursery, these are experiences that she had with her parents of something that has made the relationship broken with her own, her attachment with her own. So she's insecure in herself and in her attachment. So she's having people in her own mind, you know how you have kind of recordings, oh, I'm no good. They told me I'd be no good. I'm not mm-hmm. going to be ever a good parent. I'm it's negative, negative, negative. So one way to do it is look at Alicia Lieberman's angels in the nursery, looking at the resilience. Okay, there might have been these bad influences or these negative influences, but let's look what went well and can we replicate that? Can we find what well? The other thing is because a lot of these mothers don't have that secure attachment, you can try it with your relationship to build trust. Trust is the basis of our whole human being experience. Trust, right? And so if they don't trust anybody, 
they're certainly not going to trust me. But if you can over time, mother the mother. So she's not going to feel like trash. She doesn't feel like she's never going to be a good mother and she can't do this. That's how you do it. And it works beautifully. You mentioned secure attachment. We keep talking about the term. What is attachment? What is it supposed to look like? And what does it often look like in the mothers and babies and fathers you're seeing? So it was Dr. John Bowlby, who was actually called the father of attachment. And he basically said there's secure attachment, which is what we want, and insecure attachment. And he actually delineated three different types of insecure attachment. And what we're looking at are disorganized or fragmented relationships. So a very easy example would be a baby cries and the baby is hoping to have someone respond. Okay. <laughs> and, and usually, you know, the mother or the father is going to pick up the baby and the baby's going to be fed and, and baby's tucked in. And that's fine. And so the baby knows, Hey, when I cry, somebody's going to respond. But what happens when that baby cries and cries and cries and nobody responds, mm -hmm. then the baby shuts down Baby gets angry and baby doesn't learn to trust. That goes on and on and on again. And you lead to insecure attachment, which leads to lack of trust, which leads to lack of empathy. So attachment is really, really critical. In our own human relationships, attachment to me is, is probably a basis of our, as, as far as our trusting goes. So attachment is extremely important to look at this. And for what baby, does attachment mean? It's going to be the uh, ability of the, you might think of the dance, the mother and the child. I'm just talking the mother could be the father in the dyad relationship so that the, the, the mother and the child are a unit and a mm -hmm. unit that is um, complementing each other. So the baby enjoys the mother, the mother enjoys the baby, and they build this secure bond between of trusting and they enjoy each other. And that's not, not everything's always perfect. We yeah. talk about the good enough parent, but at least there's enough good experiences that will overcome any sort of the negative. And they can trust that parent. That child has a secure base. They know if the child goes out and explores, there's always going to be someone there to be there for that child. If the child goes out and explores or needs some, some uh, cuddling or something, there's going to be someone that will welcome them in. Many times our mothers have had that experience that they were rejected. Oh, go off, run off, go on. You know, you're, I'm too busy now. And they don't get the, just the touch, just, hey, you know, you're just a good person. This is just critical for our babies and for us actually too. You know, something, something I'll bet maybe new moms or moms to be that are listening could be frightened by listening to you because oh, in a God. sense, in a sense, they could think, oh my goodness, what if the baby cried and I didn't know uh, and I, and I missed one or, 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 you know, what if I didn't stare at them right last night or something? But, but it's, I think it's probably worth pointing out. Right. This is repeated behavior over time or right. the absence of a repeated behavior over time, not a one or a two time right. off. Right. And we talk about the good enough parent. You oh. only have to be good enough 30% of the time. Wow. 30%. Okay. Because we all can mess up, but as long as we're thirty percent of the time, they say that's good enough to build that secure attachment, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Mm. So, that so is amazing. Good. So, yeah. if a child by the age of five has not developed attachment to a parent like they're supposed to, how can that be reversed? How can you make up for lost time, or can you? First of all, how are you going to see that? You should not have. A stranger going to a room, like if I go into an exam room, I should not have a little toddler come and give me a great big hug. Oh, yeah, I'm so happy to see you. Uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> oh. That's not good. They it's should cute. come to the parents for the hug, yeah. not yeah. to me, okay? So that immediately they says, okay, there's something going on here. They should not be hugging me, okay? But what you can do, again, is to work with the parent because – they may have never been hugged themselves as children. They may not even see that the child is needing this. So you work with the dyad, either through videotaping or through classes, psychoeducation like circular security, just to talk about it, be reflective. It doesn't come just like that. You build a relationship and you reflect upon what, what are you doing? Because many times we do stuff we don't even think about what we're doing. So this is kind of mega cognition, videotaping, oh, Let's see what's going on in the situation. Put yourself in your child's shoes. 
what is your child thinking? What do you think when your child is doing something? Don't say, oh, he's just doing that to get my attention. No, he's doing that to get my connection. And there's a huge difference between attention and connection. Oh, that's a great point. And, and a lot of these moms, they haven't had normal modeled to them, have they? Correct. So we try to model that for them as best we can. Not taking the place of the parent, but just modeling what a good parent could be like. You know, it's funny. Um, in my own personal story, my wife and I are blessed to have two adopted children, both from long-term orphanage uh, and the Congo, Africa. And uh, we have a lot of friends who have adopted, you know, children from orphanage as well. We have weathered much better than than many of them have, but we experienced a lot of these phenomena. But no one knew quite the right or the right words to say as you do. But I remember this phenomena of any mommy will do. Uh, when our kids first came home, they would run up to strangers, just like you said, and oh. and the, the uninitiated, they would think, "Oh, what a loving child!" But in reality, and you say it so nicely, in reality, it's a flag, it's a warning. This yeah. child hasn't been connected, so any mommy uh, will do. Will do. And then I have to say, as an adopted parent, and other adopting parents will empathize with me and grab a box of tissue. I know, but I remember the very first time. I put my arm around my daughter because I always do. And it almost caught me off guard. She put her arm around me. Uh, and we knew that we had reached a huge milestone there because it was a, a show of affection and a return of affection. And, and I think most parents probably take that for granted. Um, but when it's been gone all of a child's life, it has a lasting effect, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Mm. Another little um, clue that I use in my practice is I'll ask first time mothers, can you describe your infant? And I say, and your infant's listening to you. Give me three <laughs> words to describe your infant. And I'm hoping they'll say, oh, my baby's the love of my life. My baby's so beautiful. The daddy mm. will say, oh, my baby's really handsome. He looks just like me. <laughs> no, I want something positive. However, they say, oh, my baby's so mean. My baby oh. cries all the time. My baby's really annoying. My baby looks like the daddy and he's a devil. Okay, that oh boy. <laughs> okay, we have some work to do here. So wow. the other thing you can do is when you have that situation where they're not responding or they don't seem to have that empathy, a wonderful easy technique is called speak for baby. It seems so simple, but particularly with adolescent mothers and fathers, you have the baby in the mother's or father's arms and they don't know how to interact so so you speak for the base oh mommy i love the way you're looking at me and smiling mommy you are the best mommy in the world so you're taking they they they, they get it and they uh, love it and it really really works it's called speak for baby dr okay. Opsowski and tulane do that so okay uh, so we've been talking about, around this other subject chris and i are fathers most of this is focused well you know appropriately on the mother baby but what do you do, can you do with the fathers and babies if the father is even around? Right. And a lot of times the father's not around, but, mm. um, and we try to do our very best to get the fathers involved. Um, some of the fathers I've taken care of have been in prison and they feel like, again, their fathers were in prison and like they'll yeah. never make a good dad. So you do that. You do the very, very best you can to model and of course, I'm not a father, but say, you know, you, you can still, you don't have to do what your dad did. And we do very basic things. And sometimes it's just like helping them go visit the kids, like have gas money so they can go visit the kids or help them. Hey, are you going to plan? Like, let's see what toys or, or what kind of games could you play with the children? Just very basic parenting education for the, for the dads and getting to out. Cause again, they're so negative sometimes like those again, ghosts in the nursery, you want to call it, um, of the negative. So working with the fathers in a way that's supportive and building trust. Again, trust is so important that somebody cares about them. So many of these young parents think that they're just not worth anything. You know, they were never cared for themselves or, or um, were actually traumatized. Um, maybe you had to be put in foster care. Some of them, it's just been really where they've been victims of... Um, where they've been trafficking, sex trafficking, and it's horrendous trauma. And so working mm -hmm. with both the fathers and the mothers to make them feel like they're worth something that, I have to go back to what my dad used to do. He worked as a psychiatrist on death row in San Quentin. Oh, wow. he, taught me, he taught me one of the most important lessons that I 
I tried to incorporate in my work is that he would get dressed in his three piece suit. And my dad was very, never in a three piece suit, but he, on, <laughs> he'd be in a three piece suit and he would go up and he'd say to the guard, I want to speak to Mr. So and so. And he said, You address them with dignity, with Mr., like they really are worth it, that they're, you know, made in the in the image and likeness of God and they're worth it and you treat them with the utmost respect. And so I tried to do the same thing that my dad did. And he was able to go in by himself to death row to take care of these people. In any case, so I tried to do the same thing, dressing up for them, addressing them as, you know, in a way that's respectful, um, not hey, you or something, but in a way that's showing that, hey, you are really worth it and you are really uh, a human being that's really worth the dignity of being the image of God. Wow. Liz, that reminds me, hearing you say that, we love to ask this question to our guests, but you know, you're not just a psychologist or just a mental health worker. You're a Catholic mental health worker. Uh, how does your, your faith and church teaching, how does that motivate you, guide you, and inform how you uh, approach your families? Well, I guess I get the inspiration from Mother Teresa of Calcutta, uh, and I'm not picking off maggots from people on the street, but I, <laughs> I couldn't do that. Emotional but, maggots. Uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but the, the same way that she teaches her sisters is that you go and receive your strength from receiving our Lord daily mm. and communion, and then you go and take care of, of, your, of, of our Lord that you see in your patients, little babies daddies, mommies, and that's how one is able to do it. You know, it's interesting listening to you. I'm reminded Tom and I've had so many guests on so many topics that, you know, the, sort of the moral of the story you might say is the natural order and the natural law is the best. And if that gets disruptive, badness happens. And, and listening to you talk about children, you know, you think what's best for a child is a family. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be perfect, right? Just good enough, <laughs> as you said. But but there needs to be a loving family unit. And if you destroy that, if you tear that down, uh, it's the children and society later on that are going to suffer. On the one hand, that's frightening because it would be so easy to mess up. But on the other hand, listening to you, I'm I feel hopeful because oh, yes. it's just not it's just not that hard to do it right, is it? Yes. So. There is a lot of hope. So um, I hope this isn't a depressing. So topic. last question. If somebody, we got 40 seconds left. If somebody needs an infant mental health specialist or someone good at it, where do they start looking? Well, the Catholic psychotherapists are now starting to do infant mental health. We're starting to uh, bring together infant mental health people around the country that are part of our Catholic psychotherapists. Also, um, one could look at zero to three uh, or in each state you'll find whatever state it is, infant mental health, and you can find people through your state that do this. So Very good. Yeah, zero to three dot com. I've been on their website researching this. Excellent. Well, Liz Hein, uh, physician assistant, psychologist, Catholic, mental health worker, thank you for joining us <laughs> on Dr. Doctor, and thank you and God bless you for your amazing work. I'm sure there are families and many, many families that are better off because they encountered you. So thank you. We'd love to have you back. Thank you very much for your time. Welcome back to Dr. Doctor. And as always in the last segment of our show, welcome back to the trivia question. It's a real brainy one. Coming from Tom, our, what would you expect? Yes. That's right. It's about baby brains. And uh, so at birth, a baby has about the same number of nerve cells in its brains as uh, you and I do. But the brain's a lot smaller. So the question is, what percent of that baby's future full-size brain does it have at birth? And if you guess 25%, you're on target. So it's got to grow four times bigger than at birth, but it's already got over, you know, a trillion connections between yeah. nerves when it's born. That's just, I, I can't fathom that. <laughs> you know, related trivia, uh, any mom knows about the soft spot in the top of their baby's head. Yes. And that soft spot is there because the bones of the skull, it's not actually one bone, it's several bones, and they aren't fused together because it has to expand so much to accommodate this computer yes. whose hard drive is growing and growing and growing. <laughs> yeah, it, it is remarkable what happens. And it's so much better than any hard drive. <laughs> so Far better. So, so Chris, there was a lot in that episode from Liz. What do you have as your top three takeaways? 
Yeah, you know, an over, I guess, an overreaching principle is, uh, and all the time we're talking with her and preparing for the show, there is this sort of flip flop between, oh my gosh, this is terrible, and oh my gosh, this is wonderful. You know, there, there is, there is hope, as she, as she said at the end. There, um, it, it's just, it, it's frightening, but yet at the same time, we should be hopeful because good interventions can make a difference. But, you know, I, I would say the top three have to be. Um, one of them is that interventions can start early. In fact, even before the baby's born. Yeah, so all of us, you know, all of us as healthcare providers, even dermatologists uh, could spot problems <laughs> uh, in pregnancy and pre-pregnancy that maybe if they were connected to the right person could make a difference for that child after it, after it's born. Um, I think my favorite thing that she said, that yes. difference between attention seeking and connection seeking uh, my baby just wants attention. No, actually, your baby wants connection, and they're not the same thing. Um, that one really stuck with me. And then my absolute favorite thing that she said that I think is most uplifting is this yes. idea that despite our best effort, Tom, you and I are probably just good enough because you only just, have to be 30%. Just. You know, <laughs> yes. If you're, 30, if you're 30% good enough, then you're good enough to establish connection uh, and, and to establish attachment with our children. So I find that motivating and hopeful. I'm glad there's that therapeutic range, that dose range <laughs> for attention. Because uh, most of us who would have graded ourselves failures were probably good enough. But how many parents really struggle, especially maybe new moms, that I've got to be perfect. I've just got to be perfect or my child's not going to Harvard. Well, your child's going to be perfect, as perfect as anybody, and they probably shouldn't go to Harvard anyway. So, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we don't this have to be really perfect. It's really expensive. <laughs> yeah. It's the striving for holiness and perfection, not the achieving that matters. Well, thank you, listeners, for being with us for our second peripartum episode in a row here on Dr. Doctor. You can find this and all our old episodes on our website, drdoctor.org. Just click on Episode Archive at the top where you can search exactly 279 episodes by topic or guest. And if you want to understand why our wives say we have a face made for radio, you can check out the video version of our show by using our YouTube link. Go to our website, drdoctor.org, and click on the, uh, the YouTube link. You can see us all you like. If you've got a question or a comment or a topic you'd like us to cover, click Submit Question. We would love to hear from you. This is Dr. Tom McGovern. And this is Dr. Chris Stroud. We're signing off until your next dose of Dr. Doctor. Doctor.